Thank you, Steve, for this nice introduction, and thank you for the invitation to give this talk here. It's always coming exciting to, to come to, to APS, because also this is a very vivid place if it comes to photon science. Uh, for me, it was a bit of a top, uh, problem. If I talk to you, it's like preaching to the priest, because, I mean, you, you know probably everything. So I thought about, well, maybe not all of you know. Well, uh, first of all, I was taught not all are experts. So maybe for some of you, I'm a bit too basic. It's definitely for Michael or others. So don't forgive me for that. I hope that others might uh, then take some benefit for that. I will tell you a bit about Daisy and where we are. One or two slides that you know in which environment we are acting. And then I, I go through our photon sources. I should mention that European XFEL is, of course, an own company, but we have a very strong contribution to uh, European XFEL. And I go through the uh, photon sources, tell you a bit about the status what are the challenges we see for the future and how we're going to tackle them? So, and of course, everything I talked to Petro3 probably one-to-one -one can be mirrored to APS at the moment, only that we will be a few years later if everything works out really nicely. Then I thought maybe I should report a bit about the, the recent uh, technological developments that have taken place on, on our site, which could be also of interest to you here. Uh, these are technological developments in case of X-ray optics or detection systems. And in the end, I have one or two slides on how we develop our site uh, in terms of scientific environment. Uh, while you are here in a big multi, multidisciplinary lab, uh, we in, in DAISY, we started as a high energy lab and we just have slowly to build up uh, expertise in, in complementary fields and fields that are uh, complementary to our photon sources. Now, uh, Helmholtz is the roof organization of all German labs. These are the labs in Germany and uh, we have, these are 18 national labs, they have quite some, some, some budget. Uh, un unfortunately, I learned that some of the universities in the uni US have a similar budget. Uh, we are 30,000 employees, uh, 20,000 scientists. We educate a lot of students and trainees as well. Of course, that's done together with universities because we cannot grant degrees. Uh, we are organized in six so-called research fields, energy, earth and environment, health, key technologies, matter, this is where we are, and transport and space. And matter is, these are the centers that are in matter, so there are seven centers in matter, and to, maybe that's interesting for you, and also something which is happening in, in Germany or in Europe generally, that uh, information technology becomes much more important, and so key technologies has been renamed to information. And maybe you know that those, those people uh, from supercomputing, Jülich, the Jülich Research Center is one of the key players here. DAISY itself, we have two sites. One is the main site that most of you know, others might know, not know that we have a second site, about a tenth of the Hamburg site in close to Berlin, in the southeast of Berlin. In total, we are half the size at, at Argon probably, with 2,300 uh, staff. We have roughly 3,000 users, out of them are 2,700 in synchrotron, but this is increasing because the number of Petra 3 beamlines is still in the, in the upbuilding phase. So we, get, uh, we count users only once, even if they come several times. So this has to be distinguished from user visits why other people count user visits, to be honest. And those are these two sites. Now, coming to synchrotron radiation, and I, have this, I found this old plot, which is, of course, highlighting our things. And uh, if you plot Moore's law over time, then you see the slope here is much higher. So actually, we have performed better than, uh, than microelectronics in terms of performance. However, we just go to a, come to, to limits now. Uh, so what, and I, I come to this slide several times now, uh, what has enabled this huge uh, increase in, si uh, in, in, um, in brilliance? I probably have to talk, uh, talk about brightness here. Uh, uh, or you call it spectral brightness in the, in, in, the, in the United States. I think in Europe we call it still brilliance. Uh, but you see it from the, from the units that what is meant. So in the beginning, of course, we had only, uh, well, if these electrons circulate uh, around and they get deflected, they radiate in a very narrow cone that depends on the relativistic energy uh, the radiation. And in the beginning, we were using bending magnets here in the first generation sources. That means we only get one light flash for each bunch of electrons flying apart. And very soon, the people in the 60s already learned if I have a, a wiggler, which is a, an alternated sequence of magnetic poles, uh, that I get many of those wiggles, and each time the electrons are deflected, they radiate, and then I get, well, if the NE is the number of electrons, I get a linear increase with the number of the 
of the poles. And this was the time when we had the second generated source. And the last one probably that was switched off was stories. We switched it off in the end of 2012. So uh, then, of course, I think it was immediately uh, in the same time that uh, uh, the people invented the undulator. And this is the main working horse for most of the third generation sources at present. So in the undulator, <coughs> sorry, very qualitatively, if I take a single electron and, as, and adjust the parameters such that the path difference of the light of each of these individual poles here as compared to the electrons is exactly a multiple of the wavelength, then I get an increase because the amplitudes add up. And that means for the intensity I get roughly, and we know that it's not exactly the case, but roughly I get something like a square with the number of poles. So if you have 30 poles here, you get a factor of 1,000 more intensity and could be even more. There are some, uh, some limitations there, but this is the rough thing where why we got here from, let's say, something like 10 to the 12, 14 to 15 to the 10 to the 20 range where uh, Petra 3, APS, EOSREF, the, the, the present day machines are, and I don't want to, to go much in detail. So this is the, the huge increase was just because I increased the number, uh, the, the, the process, I, I used an amplitude and constructive interference process in the underlater. Now let's look a bit closer on the underlater. Assume we have a single electron, then we have a natural divergence that's given by the wavelength and the length of the underlater and the natural source size from the individual electron. We never can get better in phase space as these numbers. Uh, real storage rings have, however, a finite source size and a finite their divergence, just that I have not a single electron, but I have an, an ensemble in the bunch, and they have a certain, uh, a certain size in phase space. Uh, those numbers, uh, this is the horizontal one. Vertically, uh, our storage things are much better, and this coupling constant is normally something in the order of 1%. Oops. Uh, one, that's dangerous here. Uh, don't laugh. Uh, in, in, in the order of 1% which is quite good, but could be down as a tenth of a percent, could be 3% in some cases. Now, we have a problem. Well, the horizontal emittance is a very characteristic equilibrium quantity of each storage ring. It depends on the energy square, the angle of the individual bending magnet, and it's a lattice type function that more or less the machine physicists can explain you more, but takes into case focusing uh, and other uh, lattice op um, uh, op uh, properties of the magnetic lattice. We have here a conflict because if you want to have X-rays, that means photons, and I took now the, the characteristic or the energy, the critical energy of a, of a bending magnet here, just as a, to explain the numbers. Actually, if you want to have X-rays here, the B field is more or less something in one in the one Tesla regime of the order of one Tesla. We have an E squared term here, so. This quantity we want to have small, but it's proportional to the E squared. This quantity we want to get high in the 10 or 20 kV range if we want to have real X-rays, but we also need an E squared. So we have a problem here. What saves us, and especially the large sources that uh, APS, ESRF, Spring 8, or Petra 3, is that we have uh, this angle here, which is more or less the inverse number of the bending magnets here on the to the third power. That means by increasing the number of bending magnets, we can get the emittance small even if the E squared is high. And this is what, uh, well, probably most of you know, this is the, the quantity that is exploited in order to get this emittance further down for this storage ring. Now let's look what is the characteristic uh, quantity that we want to optimize in these new sources in, if you go towards the fourth generation. And this is the brilliance. Uh, you always substitute brilliance by brightness uh, in order to, to be in the uh, North American uh, nomenclature. And this means it's the total flux. So the total flux will not be more. So those people that want to have more photons, uh, we cannot do that. Uh, this is more or less the number of the current in the machine, the number of poles of the undulator and E squared, which is important because uh, this E squared here, you cannot beat with smaller sources. And then here in the denominator, we have the effective source size and the effective source divergence. And those, if I assume Gaussian distributed beams and some, make some other approximation, depend, of course, on the properties of the individual electrons plus that of the storage ring. Now, the good news is in the vertical uh, direction, in the y direction, 
this contribution is almost not much larger than the one of a natural electron. So we are very close to what we call the diffraction limit. We hardly can get better. A bit maybe, but for softer X-rays or say, let's say low single digit KV, all the machines, APS, ESRF, Petra, all in the vertical direction are already at the diffraction limit. Horizontally, this is good news. No, that was the wrong one. That was this one. That's the good news. I put in the wrong direction. In the horizontal, we are far away from that. So there is potential to optimize the machine. And this is what, what you are planning, where you also have filed in first, first components to buy, where, uh, where all the practically all third generation sources have upgrade plans. Now, another point we should consider that the coherent flux, there are experiments that exploit the coherence, let's say coherence imaging experiments, uh, photon correlation spectroscopy, or every nanofocusing experiment. I only can focus the coherent flux. The coherent flux is directly proportional to the brilliance. So if I can increase the brilliance, I increase here, and of course the wavelength. So this we cannot change, but we can do something here. It depends mostly on the brilliance. To be honest, in, in the X-ray regime, we are lousy here. We are below 1%. Even at Petro 3 with, with, with one nanometer, we are still below 1%. So we throw away 99% of all the photons if you make a very small focus, and which is, of course, something which is not acceptable, I would say, but we can do something about that. Now, how do we sell the whole thing? And this is now a typical slide we show to the politician. Of course, uh, these, sor these uh, synchrotron sources, they have to serve somehow the scientific community. Of course, we do that in private under us for our fun, but in the end, we have to serve the, first, uh, uh, the community. And then, of course, what are the most applications where small beams could help? Uh, well, I start with structural biology. Standard structural biology, I say frankly, and I think most of you will agree, won't benefit too much. But if it comes to those new techniques where we, we have uh, serial, uh, ser serial uh, crystallography with extremely small crystals where you shoot in thousands of crystals and get thousands of individual images and you merge them together, they also might, due to the better uh, capabilities to focus down the beam, also benefit from those new sources. And then all of those techniques, like in energy and climate, photovoltaic, I mean, these are very complicated layer structures. And we learned in experiments that we did at Petra, normally you say layer structure, you don't need a small beam, because if it's, if it's translation periodic in that dimension, you only have to look in one dimension. It's easy. But they are not homogeneous in, one in, in this dimension as well. So you need small beams to analyze that uh, better than we can do it now, just as an example here information technology, looking on chips, of course you can use an electron microscope. You get a much better resolution than we ever can do. But first, you cannot look inside. You have to carefully prepare your sample. And doing in situ or operando experiments are also very, very difficult. So this is where X-rays at the resolution that we can achieve certainly will be able to make an impact. High pressure research, people here at, at Petra and also here have now achieved pressures in excess to twice the pressure in the inside of the Earth. This means you have extremely small samples, because otherwise even diamonds will not be able to, to, to uh, uh, generate these pressures. And here, you cannot get even over a several micrometer space a homogeneous stress and strain contribution, and you need a small beam to probe that. And of course, all the materials we have, I mean, I was really astonished you're talking to steel people. And maybe you know if you, if you harden steel and you then anneal it, you get something like pearlit. The people don't know anything about the strain distribution in this lamella. Because it's in the nanometer regime. No one has ever measured that. And they say they would be very much interested in getting that. At the moment, we don't have the technology to do that. So these are just examples. There are probably many more examples. And I just want to give you an idea. Yes, we can do a lot already now. But there are still a lot of things that we could do better uh, if we would have more powerful, smaller beams. Now, that brings me to Petra. I first will tell you a bit about Petra. So it's a 6 GV machine. We operate at 100 milliamps. At the moment, the emittance is something like 1.2 nanometer radian, which is, for the high energy machine, the best value that we have in the world. Vertically, it's something between 5. I always give always the typical number. That means the best achieved. Um, we operate between 5 and 10 picometers. So we are, this is a quantity we hardly will be able to improve. We have a very large, large circumference. It's 2.3 kilometers. 
However, I should mention to the experts among you that the poor bending part is only maybe roughly a little bit less than 1,700 meters because the rest are so-called straight sections that we use at present for damping wicklers, but they don't necessarily help to uh, in include um, bending magnets if you don't find a, a, a smart way you're using that. We started with this first project with 14 beam lines. Uh, we have 30 experiments. Uh, normally, in a regular user year, we provide something like 5,000 hours to the users. To be honest, we have an extension project running. At the moment, we have long, a slightly longer shutdown. So we are more or less, in this year, by, I think by 4,200. And from next year on, we should be back to regular user operation. The machine is quite old, and Daisy is recycling the machine several times. So we started in 1978 uh, with, uh, as, a, as a collider where they actually find the gluon. Uh, we rebuilt the machine, started the rebuild construction of the machine in 2007, mid of 2007, July, in, and started commissioning the machine also in, in, uh, two years later and had first uses three years later after that one. Uh, we had another machine running doors in that area here, and we had to shut down it in 2012 and started in February 2014 an extension project that in addition to these beam lines gave us another 12 beam lines. So in the end, if this is finished, we have 26 beam lines at Petra. Uh, at Petra, yes. Uh, I don't need, I think more or less, I don't want to go through all those, those things. Most of those uh, experiments are actually, uh, I think almost all of them use micrometer focus these days. Uh, this is just a repetition of what I said already. I should mention that we not only have high, uh, high energy photon beam lines, but we also have a variable polarization X to V beam line, and I should also mention that uh, part of the beam lines are operated by the Helmholtz Centrum Gestag. So this is a partner center in material science. And uh, the last beam lines in structural biology, so part of the structural biology beam lines, are operated by the European Molecular Biological Laboratory, uh, one of our partners to do structural biology. Uh, I mentioned that we had, uh, in addition to the main experimental hall, we had an extension project ongoing, uh, bringing us another 12 beam lines. Uh, the, we are in the middle of this uh, project, uh, so two of the beam lines are operational here in user operation, uh, two others we just ordered the, the concrete work and the shielding work. Uh, some of the instruments are already delivered. Here, four beam lines, the hatches are finished, one is uh, in commissioning, and two will still be, see beam uh, this year and, next, and, and early spring next year. We, the next one will become operational. So soon, by end of 2018, we should have another uh, four beam lines uh, operational. Here I should mention that uh, those beam lines are uh, uh, realized in close cooperation with Sweden, so we have a Swedish material science beam line, uh, with colleagues from India, and also within the framework of uh, Russian-German collaboration. To be honest, uh, this is a bit cool since the Krim, area, uh, Krim event. Um, now let's go back. If we, this is one of those typical slides you show for PRs. Uh, this is the, uh, the whole length scale with, that we are interested in, from the Planck scale to intergalactic distances. And on a log scale, actually, we demand quite a large portion for us. And if you look, how can we, how can we bridge this area, which is more or less where synchrotron radiation is active? And I don't go too much in all the details, because most of you uh, know that very well in biology, also in material science, uh, what is interesting there. Then it might not hold for the entire energy range, and may, maybe some other people have different opinions. As long as we have diffraction, we get very good and can make crystals. We get very uh, precise information in the angstrom regime, and, uh, or as big as the molecule is. Uh, in imaging, we get down to, the, let's say, to 150, maybe even to the 10 nanometer regime. If, it, uh, if it's in the soft X-ray regime. But in the end, what is shown here as a gap, it's difficult with X-rays to get good information if it's non-translation periodic, non-crystalline mat matter here. And uh, it's difficult with present sources. And the hope is that with diffraction-limited light sources, and I show you this, this a bit in numbers, we can partially or we can close this gap. Of course, there are other methods to close this gap, but very many of them don't have the advantage that synchrotron radiation has, where we have a lot of different contrast mechanisms, species sensitivity, sensitivity to, to uh, phonons, God name it. Uh, this we can do in, in that field. At the moment, this is not, not really wide, but let's say it's certainly less well developed as, let's say, the micrometer regime or the regime that is accessible by diffraction through crystallographic techniques. 
Now, I would like to give you one example of a recent experiment done at Petra, not recent, not too recent, where I can show you what are the problems that we have uh, these days. So, uh, people have noticed that they, this is a, a cracking fluid, catalytic cracking, where they convert high boiling, high molecular weight uh, petroleum or crude oil into more valuable gas, gasoline and olefinic gases. And they had zeolite particles they use for that porous, uh, in porous clay, and they have roughly the size of several tenth micrometer. And they learned, or they noticed, that these zeolite particles, they decay. Normally, if it's a catalyst, it shouldn't decay. So something happens to them, and they came to us and then say, what can we do? The people said, OK, let's do uh, 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 tychography and fluorescence tomography to analyze what's going to happen. Maybe for, to those of you that are not examples, I briefly explain what is tychography. You take only, now comes the problem, the coherent part of the beam. That means less than 1%, because the rest is, is not coherent. And then, of course, the beam is extremely small, and assume this test pattern is the sample. Then you rest the scan, as it's shown here, the result, the sample through the beam in total. And since the, you have a coherent illumination, even if the object is not translation periodic, you get a diffraction pattern, which is, is shown here and a uh, uh, on the detector. And in the end, you can put together all this uh, diffraction pattern. Each diffraction pattern is oversampled, so it's closer sample than the Newquist frequency, and in the end, you can reconstruct your object out of that one slice. At the same time, of course, you could measure uh, the fluorescence, and now this technique has been applied on these particles in tomographic mode. That means they had to do a several thousand scans in that direction, then they rotate the sample and do that again. In the end, they sampled something like 19 million data points in 24 hours. Imagine you have a diffraction-limited storage shrink. Then you can do, this is a demonstration experiment, you can do something like that in an hour or in half an hour. Of course, there are some problems that we have to solve. First, the data rates. Because these were 210 terabytes collected on one beamline in, 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 uh, in one day. I guess some of the imaging beamlines here probably have the same data rates. The worst thing, and this is something where you at, at Argonne are in a prime position to make a contribution, is it took us, or the people, 30 days on a four, on a, a four NVIDIA GPU system to get the first image. That means here we have a huge problem actually in computing. And that's what comes more and more and more in our science, that we, we drowning in data and publications between time between the experiment and the publications take longer and longer because the people hardly can deal with these masses of data. And it's not only the hardware, because I mean, may, maybe you get now the, with the latest uh, GPUs a factor of two more, uh, you can probably paralyze it even a bit more, but you will never end up at the moment with just hardware solutions with, let's say, half a day, even if you have infinite, infinite amount of money. So in the end, one also has to think about new methods to do this reconstruction and things like that. So here we have two really big things. So I, I, I just uh, want to tell you at least of those of you that are a bit in material science, what was finally the result. Of course, the result is mean you get the electron density of this particle, you can see the periodicity, and from the fluorescence scan, you can also the, uh, see uh, where are different elements. And in the end, what they found out, that these porosity, those, those uh, channels, were just clocked by, by nickel and iron that were in the feedstock of the original material. So in principle, you re reduce those, material, uh, those iron and nickel contents, and they make damage or make the, 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 the particle useless. If one needs to do this not only on one particle, but on many, or on different conditions, uh, you need just much more coherent flux at, at hard X-rays, and this is just an example, and I guess beamland scientists from APS and from other sources have certainly a number of other ideas in their field where more coherent flux at hard X-rays is much better, and of course data handling and computing capacities. We have to really invest in that field, and we have neglected this field, maybe not totally, but we need to address this field much more uh, than we did in the past. Okay, what is, the, what is our aim with, with uh, what we call Petra 4? And at the moment, our beam size is something in the high beta section of 140 times 6 micrometer. And if I told you already, if I focus that down, I have to throw away about 90%, uh, 99%, and the coherent fraction is in that area. 
if I would be able to get to the diffraction limit, and I think uh, max four Sirius, ESRF, and then APS, and this is more or less a, a temporary order here, uh, uh, they are on the way to do that already. We probably get something like a, a six by six by six micrometer beam, and uh, which almost completely could be focused into a very small focus. Uh, we aim for something, to be honest, we are in the middle of this process, and we don't know where we end up. We could end up at 15, but we could also end up 25 picometers. We really don't know. It depends also on, on final what can we afford in budget, but that brings us to a maximum brilliance of maybe one or two orders of magnitude more, but a considerably higher coherent uh, fraction, and uh, well, what our advantage is certainly the large circumference. Uh, we can use the, the straights to get in maybe damping undulators, and we have, of course, something like 1.6 or 1.7 kilometers on both, where we can put a lot of individual cells with, with uh, bending magnets, uh, according to this equation, brings us down the, the emittance. Uh, the whole thing, uh, this is just repeating what I just said, and I just, how does it fit on our side? on our campus. This is a, a schematic view of the campus. It means that we have already these three halls, and we probably need another hall here, because in addition, we also would like to increase the number of undulator ports at least to something like 30. This part is almost inaccessible because it's below ground and even buildings up are above them. But we still have free space here in order to add additional experimental halls if needed and if funding is available. What is our time frame? Time frame is uh, we will provide a conceptual design report uh, until mid of next year. That means we will have a first solution how something could lo look like, but we, real, we deliberately take another one or two years to, uh, to um, oh, this is wrong. I think it's 2020. Uh, another two years to finally refine that to a technical design report. And we think with, an, with a lead time of about four to five years that we can, by the end of 2024, start with the reconstruction of funding and everything uh, turns out as planned. Uh, where will it bring us? And uh, well, we always showed emittance as function of storage ring size. One could also put in here, uh, then the scale is slightly different, the, uh, the uh, uh, particle energy. And uh, so far, I mean, here you see the double band acromat systems, and you see also that those two, well, first of all, I showed the emittance, and then people said, you cannot show all there's something where good is down. Politicians need always good up. <laughs> and so what my colleague came to the idea, we don't show the, uh, we don't show the, diffraction, uh, the emittance or the diffraction-limited uh, photon energy, uh, photon uh, wavelength, we show the diffraction-limited uh, X-ray energy because then it goes up. Uh, these are the double band acromat based systems. These are the present third generation sources. And those two, Petra 3 and National Light Source, are, well, at the moment at the top in, in emittance. And we only achieve that by, by, uh, by damping wigglers. National Light Source, as far as I know, they gave up on damping wigglers or have only few ones. But for the 3 GV machine, it's already a quite large machine with many cells in order to get again a, a small emittance here. Getting any further with this technology isn't possible. And then we have the multiband acromat. I think here uh, APS is at the moment from those that are really actually uh, being realized, the, the most, uh, most advanced uh, design uh, of Petra. I'm, I'm, I made a large, and this is a log scale, so it's not too far away. Uh, I made a large thing. So we don't really know where we end up, but we target for something like 25 to, to 20 or maybe 15 picometers, and then we should be in that range. Uh, giving us, uh, according to uh, uh, diffraction-limited uh, photon energy, in, let's say, the single-digit uh, KV range. Good. And of course, now, what does it mean for the individual experiments? And there are some, let's start with the very positive ones, and I'm not sure whether XPCS parents are here, but XPCS, if assume that we have 100 times more brilliance, then XPCS gains with the square of that. That means that's a real show. That is a, a, different, a totally different show. One can really go to much shorter uh, timescales. Well, of course, maybe then have detector issues and things like that. So here we gain a lot. In those experiments where we just gain proportional to the flux density in the focus, we get, of course, more or less the sensitivity that we can get with uh, an in, in, in increase. Uh, with the increase in uh, brilliance, 
The bad thing is that in coherent imaging, where I have, now we can negotiate whether it's a one over q to the three or uh, to the power of three, or one over the q to the power of four, we gain less. If we stick with the same resolution, as I mentioned before, then of course it's it, it's, it's, uh, it uh, scales with the brilliance. However, if you want to get higher resolution, then it, it's not that much because this is a, a, a strongly nonlinear process in that field for non uh, periodic objects. So, but for some of the experiments, we really can get dramatic increase if you could Im increase the, the, the brilliance. And this is, of course, not only holding for, for Petra 4, it holds also for any other diffraction limited storage stream which goes in the same order of magnitude. Okay, now, can we do better? What better means, it's, it's, it's up to your interpretation, can we do better? So the, the the fraction limit storage ring go one or two orders of magnitude because beyond what is possible now. I told you here we made, we assumed, or what, what happens in an undulate is that for a single electron, we have a coherent or a, a phase coherent addition of the light of each individual pole. If I make the beam as small that the contribution of the storage ring is in the same order of magnitude of what a single electron has, I'm at the end here. So I'm at the physical end what I can do. The only thing that I can do is I have a lot of electrons in such a bunch. If I could convince different electrons to radiate in phase. And if you know in such a bunch I have 10 to the 9 photons, there's a huge potential. And this is actually what the free electron lasers do. That means they try to get that electrons Different electrons radiate in phase, and then you get an n square factor here of the number of electrons, and that gives you a huge increase in intensity, in theory. So how is this working? It's in a nutshell, and I tell you this, this thing is, this plot is very wrong, because it should actually oscillate like this. Assume you have an extremely long undulator. For soft X-rays, 30 meters at the, uh, 200 meters at LCLS, at the European X fell 300 meter long undulator. So that's an impressive. And you have an extremely parallel beam, a very, very small emittance. What happens now along the undulator, in the beginning, you start spontaneous emission, as in every other undulator in any storage ring. Now the light and the electron beam move in the same direction and interact with each other. And depending now of, for each individual electron, whether uh, its phase is or its, its movement here is with the phase or against the phase of the light, you get a slight deacceleration or acceleration of the electron. And in the end, after the length of the undulator, when the bunch was totally unstructured in the beginning, it gets, it gets slices. And these slices, uh, this is an animation shown here, they radiate now in phase. And this gives you this huge increase in intensity that you get on an FEL. You need an extremely high current, by a bunch, a current density in such a, in such a um, bunch. That's the reason also why these bunches are extremely short, and you need an extremely small emittance. So this is, this is working. There are some drawbacks, because we start from noise. And here is from the very early time of flash. This is the showing the pointing stability, and that's the, that is showing the, the spectrum. And you see, this is not what you are used after a monochromator at a synchrotron. It fluctuates. We have extremely short pulses, but we have them to the expense that we get some fluctuations, as long as we don't do anything about it. Well, it doesn't look too bad, actually, in the soft X-ray regime. This is 30 nanometers. But if you go in the real X-ray regime, this thing looks really not very good. So one of the challenges in the future for all the FELs is making that and that much more stable. And the key word is seeding, which is external seeding or internal seeding, and we have to look about different seeding schemes, which is actually done, at, for example, at Fermi, at Elettra, for, in the soft X-ray regime, and that's also what we plan here. So what in the end gives us this, we, if we just have now, oh, I wrote brightness here, maybe I, I thought about you guys, uh, peak brightness, now we, we normalize the brightness to the length of the, of the bunch, and then you see what huge of a difference. And this is, of course, the quantity we need if we have a time-resolved experiment, how many photons I can deliver per time. And then you see all the third-generation sources are somewhere here, and then we get this huge increase. And where does it come from? It's quite easy. This is a very 
I mean, this dates from still from Jochen Schneider, so maybe some of you know, uh, you know him still. Uh, at the synchrotron, we have roughly 10 to the 9 photons per bunch, pink, and they are order of 100 picosecond long, an individual punch, uh, bunch. At the, at the FEL, I mean, you showed how, I showed you in high resolution how lousy that looks on that scale. We have a bunch length of roughly between 2 to 10 100 or 200 femtoseconds, and something like, well, for the 2, it's probably more 10 to the 11, and for the 100, maybe 10 to the 14 photons per bunch. That means on an FEL, as a rule of thumb, in one bunch, you get as much photon that on a third generation source in one second, in an individual shot already. And that means also you can you easily know how much can I do in terms of information to extract from a sample with a single shot. Uh, just to give you an idea of where we are with our sources in Hamburg, so of course this is just a line on that scale. This is the temporal resolution, or let's say the pulse duration. Petra is roughly 100 picosecond, 90 picosecond, uh, uh, below roughly 10 to the 9 photons per pulse, even a bit less uh, uh, pink. And uh, some of you might know where the 5.2 megahertz come from. That's the timing mode of Petra with 40 bunches. Uh, the European XFL and Flash, you see here an energy scale, uh, and of course it extends over a wide energy range to well beyond 100, uh, 100 keV. Uh, Flash and uh, European XFL, you see they are in energy almost, uh, almost uh, uh, complementary. The overlap is only very little. Uh, both of them have roughly something between 10 to the 11 to 10 to the 14 flash for some, some conditions. Uh, photons per pulse. Uh, flash operates at up to uh, 8 ke uh, k uh, kilohertz, and the European uh, XFL up to 27 kilohertz. The bunch length extends from at low, not at 10 to the 13, maybe at 10 to the 11 or 10 to the 10, low or uh, low, high single digit femtoseconds let's say 10 femtoseconds, up to something like 150 or 200 femtoseconds. And that depends simply on how well you squeeze the bunch, how you, as, how, how you adjust your compression setting in the bunch compressors. Now, uh, while there are, of course, many FELs around the world, I don't want to go too much in detail, and they are, I actually want to highlight three of them. Uh, just by chance, two of them are in Hamburg. Uh, we use superconducting technology that allows us to accelerate a large number of... Um, of bunches, which is, gives you, of course, a, not only a high peak brilliance, but also a high average brilliance. Uh, flash has 8 kilohertz, 1.2 GeV, 10 hertz, and I tell you, I explain you soon what that means, 800 times uh, 10 hertz, and the X, uh, European XFL, uh, 20 kilo, uh, 27 kilohertz, 17 GeV machine, 10 hertz times 27. The individual distance within this bunch strength is 1 megahertz at flash and 4.5 megahertz at European XFL. And uh, LCLS went to the next step, and uh, this is only the first, not LCLS high energy, I think they goes up to, then it goes up to 8 GV here, and they really have a CW machine. For experiments, actually, this is the aim, and that is also for us, at least for European XFL, and maybe for Flash, the idea on the long term, you actually would like to go to CW mode of operation, because these bunch trends that we have, and I tell you that, uh, have some disadvantages. This is the Flash facility, and we recently completed the Flash 2. So we have one LINAC here that is accelerating uh, uh, particles for two lasers, and then we have the Flash 1 and the Flash 2 laser. I think I don't have to go too much in the detail here, but we can get up to, uh, for long bunches, up to a millijoule in Flash 2 now. Uh, the, big, the great advantage that we have now with the superconducting uh, RF system, we can accelerate a lot of pulse bunches, and I promise to show you we have these 10 hertz or 100 millisecond repeats of bunch trains which are 800 microsecond long. That means eight, 800 bunches here. And then there is a gap. This is due to the fact that we have still a pulsed RF and not a CW RF. And this bunch uh, distance in, in, in the European x is only 200, 222 uh, uh, nanoseconds. This is not very advantageous. I actually would like to have them equally spaced, and that's, of course, something for the future. Nevertheless, we are able, within even this bunch train, let's say, to produce 400 bunches that we send to in one laser, and then have a 50 microsecond gap, and uh, the rest of the bunches with even slightly different compression factors, everything that we can do on the level of RF, on the uh, RF frequency system, we can have slightly different uh, uh, conditions to the second laser, and we can really operate them in parallel. Of course, the energy is almost the same. Bunch compression can be different because we can, even the bunch charge can be different because those might have different lasers at the gun 
to produce that. So what I'm talking about is here we have an RF gun and we have in total three different lasers to make light, depending on the charge you need. And you can have different charges for different bunches. Then uh, you have a first accelerating module. You have actually something which is produced not far from here at Fermilab, a third harmonic cavity to linearize space, space, space. Then you have a few bunch compressors and additional uh, uh, accelerating units. And now this guy fades out. Uh, so we have um, uh, this uh, superconducting accelerating modules. Let's see whether I have my own one. And then what we call, now it works, it, yeah, we, uh, we have a dog leg and then we go into the different undulators and you can see here we have a seeding experiment standing there, that's the main undulator. And we even have a terahertz undulator here that has the big advantage that uh, you make terahertz radiation from the same bunch to of the, of the FEL and they are inherently somehow like up down to the, down to five femtoseconds synchronized. Unfortunately, this is still a fixed gap undulator, and there we have a tunable undulator. In the beginning, LCLS and us, we didn't dare to make tunable undulators for FELs. Now the undulator technology and, measure, uh, and diagnostics is good enough to do that. And uh, I want to give you some recent, advant uh, uh, recent um, successes uh, in uh, what we do, at, what we can do. We have now stabilized the arrival time of Palash to something like 14 femtoseconds. If you come to time resolved studies, you need to have such a short thing. We can, tunable underlayers is totally uncritical to change wavelengths, which is not so easy if you always have to readjust your accelerator with a fixed gap underlayer. We can get up to uh, a millijoule at soft X-rays, which is a record. It's more than 10 to the 14 photons per shot. And this is just done by tapering the underlayer. You have to imagine you get, at some stage, you get a saturation because you have restricted so much energy from the electrons that they get out of the underlayer resonance frequency. Now, of course, you can adjust K of the underlayer to make up for this difference, and then you can extract more energy. And that gives you another factor of two more energy. So we get up to one, one millijoule here. There's another very interesting thing you can, I go through that now. Um, you can reverse taper your underlayer. You just taper the underlayer such that it's not in resonant. So you first, what is the reason for that? Or why do, do you want to do that? If you do this and then put the last two underlayers on resonant, you get almost the same intensity as if you would put all the underlayers on resonance. So for a linear polarized system, it makes no sense at all. But imagine that this underlayer is a helical and Apple II device. Then you have something only a factor of 200 you can make here as a contrast difference. That means you could have an, a, an, a cheap, in quotes, linear underlayer, reverse tapered, and then you put in two, two underlayers, helical, and you get 99.5% purity circular polarized light, which is a very neat way to make circular polarized for all the magnetic study. And fast magnetism is something which is very interesting in this sense. People showed something that we can do frequency doubling. And I wanted to show, one thing I really want to show you a bit more in detail is what they called first uh, demonstration of harmonic lacing. Assume this is the, our schematic underlayer here. And we could set the underlayer to lambda. And in the, this is just to give you an idea how these underlayers flash look like. And in this case, lambda was uh, seven nanometers. For the setting they made with very short pulses, they had 12 microjoules. Now what they did, they used the first undulators and put them to 21. That means a subharmonics of the main. So what the hell should that be? And what happens is really a subharmonics has a much shorter gain length. So you get a stronger bunching, as I told you before, a str stronger slicing of the beam. And this, even if it's only a subharmonic, has a stronger effect than if you would do it in the original. And this ends up with something five times, no, not five times, made four times more intensity. That means at a much shorter underlayer length, you can uh, achieve higher uh, energy, and which is even nice with a factor of, if this is a factor of three, we get sometimes like 60 to 80% times the subharmonic uh, reduced uh, spectral width. That means we also get a better quality in, in the spectral domain better focused uh, beam. So this is something that certainly has to be taken into account for all new FELs, because this is a design parameter that no one so far had 
had on his, uh, on his agenda, and Schneidmiller and Yurkov were the guys that invented that and, and tested that the first time. Uh, I want to give you one example, which, because it's a very recent publication, uh, what sort of experiments we can do. Uh, imagine you have a, an, an FEL beam and you have a zone plate, and you know that for you, it makes probably no sense to illuminate the zone plate asymmetrically, but these people do it asymmetrically, and you see only by the path difference of the different rays that hit the sample, you can make a path difference up to 1.6 picosecond. Since, it's a, since this is a divergent beam, it goes divergent on the detector, and you, re hardly, you really can calculate uh, from the path difference where on the detector, if you measure something, at what time delay the, the beam, the photon, hit the sample. Now, you hit the sample with an infrared, and that was a 20 nanometer cobalt film, with an infrared, uh, X -ray, uh, infrared uh, laser pulse, and as a certain time difference, you have now, or actually they, they have done it overlapping, uh, you, you to take this chirped uh, uh, photon beam and you measure with one shot an entire delay curve. And here they could show that the, the spin relaxation time of this, this cobalt film is in the range of 130 because a femtosecond with an arrow of 30 femtoseconds, of course, you can do that more often and do averaging, but you can really, with one single shot, you get an entire sweep that you normally had to do step by step. You have enough photons in these systems uh, with uh, a single shot to get an entire time spectrum here. And that's a, a very neat and new instrument development. Okay, in the future, we want to, of course, strong, stronger exploit the higher rep rate. Uh, we have these are smaller things that we plan. Tunable underlayers at flash one is, is our highest priority because it would be the, uh, much easier to adopt the experimental conditions to the requirements of the user. Uh, we want to get slightly higher uh, 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 energy. We can uh, exchange some of our uh, modules by modules with a higher gradient, and we have some potential here. Not too much, but maybe in total something like 200 MeV that we could more would like to get circular porous light. I showed you the thing with the afterburger. People have now explored something like single spike lacing, making extremely short pulses where they give only one mode. And this is, of course, for spectroscopy experiment, we could, could stabilize that one, it would make spectroscopy experiment much more easier. Or this is not an alternative. Maybe they, they are complementary. We, we are also working on external seeding schemes with the S-flash experiment, and that it only needs very powerful lasers at high repetition rate, which are not readily available, so you have to develop them by yourself. That's something which is still on our agenda. And uh, we have to upgrade our pump probe laser and increase, think about possible ways towards those experiments with highly dilute target to increase the repetition rate. So, finally, the European XFEL. I mean, I think it's, it's I should mention, European XFEL is an own company. DAISY is operating the 1.9 kilometer long superconducting accelerator on behalf of European XFEL. But on the other hand, DAISY is also the 58% 50 shareholder of European XFEL. So sometimes it's a bit difficult to know which hat we just wear when we talk to these people. Uh, so we are strongly interlinked, I would like to say here. So here is our campus with Petra 3, and so there is the injector building, and then it goes along here, and here is the new experimental hall. Uh, as I mentioned, 1.9 kilometer here is accelerated, and the whole thing is 3.4 kilometers long. It's below ground, and as you can see, these are these cryogenic modules for the cryogenic uh, superconducting underlayers. Here are the pictures from the beam lines, the experimental hall. Uh, the f this is a bit older already. This is a part, it's, it's already full now, uh, the first part of the experimental stations. I should mention that Robert Feidenhansen, and some of you in, in surface diffraction certainly know him from Denmark, from Copenhagen, has taken over the job as a new DG. In December 2015, we had the first beam in the injector. We started to cool down the main Linux in November 2016. We had the first electron beam uh, in, in January 2017. We saw first lasing at nine angstroms in 4th of May. The, at the 25th of May, we achieved the commissioning goal. You know, this is a, a com, uh, we have, um, 11 countries, and they had this, uh, agreed on what needs to be achieved that we can call the whole thing to be in operation, because then also the operation budget is released. So the two angstroms at one millijoule per pulse has been achieved at 25. Last week, they achieved 1.3 angstrom at 1.2 millijoule at 300 hertz. That means 30 pulses, 
not the 2,700. It takes some time. They are very careful because 2,700 pulses, if you miss steer that beam, you have a driller hole somewhere. So everything is done slowly commissioned. And what is most exciting, I think in two weeks, they are the first user experiment. So they had to call for proposals, 60 proposals. For 12 of them, they had beam time. And uh, the first of them will be at September 2017. I also should mention, this is the, the more formal things. Uh, last, uh, on September 1st, so last Friday, we had the official inauguration. Uh, this is our minister. This is the mayor of ha Hamburg. This is a representative of, of the different countries, uh, the head of the council. And that was a big event. And well, all people are happy that the whole thing is now there. I should mention that we are strongly involved in, in uh, European Excel, also science-wise. Uh, European Excel went for out for a call for international uh, consortium. And we are involved in HIBEV, which is a strong laser system, where we have a 32 laser uh, for uh, uh, a Tysafa laser for making, uh, making warm dense matter. But we also will have a, a kilo 2 laser system for, for ramped compression uh, that we will build up together with, I mean, mostly in the driver's seat is, is, H, uh, is Helmholtz Zentrum Dresden uh, Rosendorf, uh, the science technology. Uh, uh, Council in uh, UK and Daisy. Uh, these are the Daisy people, and uh, uh, headed uh, the whole thing is by uh, Tom Cowan from HADR. We are strongly involved with that one. Here we are the leader, Henry Chapman, Daisy, with money from Wellcome Trust, Max Planck, and many others, sets up a serial femtosecond crystallography station at the single par uh, particle imaging station at the European XFEL. And uh, somehow a smaller involvement is uh, what they call Heisenberg Riggs. It's a time resolved Riggs experiment where you really want to go at the Heisenberg limit. Here we are main partners together with the University of Potsdam. And there are some smaller user consortia dealing with data, data handling, uh, uh, control molecules, and with time resolved XPCS, uh, XPS. Technical development, DAISY was leading one of those uh, big detectors that has been installed at Egypt. And I'm quite thankful because I think prototypes of them have been tested here at, at, uh, at APS as well during the time we had a long shutdown. So this has a frame rate of 4.5 megahertz. He, of course, not sustained, but uh, this uh, 44 and a half megahertz, they can do up to 350, it should be written somewhere here, uh, in a burst mode of 350 images, which are stored on the chip. And then during the breaks of the FEL, they can be read out. Uh, the dynamic range is an integrating detector. The, it has adaptive gain switching. Its dynamic range is 10 to the 4. Uh, it has single photon sensitivity beyond 5 kV. You can see that here. That's a histogram, and you easily can see the different different photons that are working. Pixel size is rather large, because if you want to store 350 images on a pixel, you need simply some space. What is not known, that this technology is able in CW, maybe one put, would make a different detector, but it can sustain 20 kilohertz. And that might be interesting for us where things lead to. Uh, the first one megahertz system, as you can see here, is installed at European Expert, and I think it goes to take real data. I mean, they did already test data uh, in, in two weeks. Uh, another thing that might be uh, interesting to you is uh, Sasha Byte in our group uh, uh, is, has um, working, is working on multilayers. And she was really able with break multilayers, that means multilayers where the, 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 the layers are not, not parallel but slightly inclined towards the break angle of these things. She was able, I mean, it's not totally clean there. She's, she's not very happy with that, but she knows where it comes from to get a sub uh, eight or nine nanometer focus. Uh, in the hard X-ray regime, I think it was 16 kV, uh, yeah, 16 kV, with a rather high efficiency. The efficiency was hi higher than 50%, which is, of course, exciting. It's not published so far. It's, I mean, it's submitted and probably close to being published. And that's also an interesting development. I mean, you see here these lobes, which are always appearing. And if you have CRLs, you also can, maybe you can see that in, on, maybe in, here you see it better. You always get these side lobes, because never you get a really exact for CRLs, for example, the exact parabolic shape. So if you have an optics that always has the same errors, which is difficult with bent mirrors because your bending mechanism might make different errors, then what you can do is you can try to, by tychography again, tychography doesn't only deliver you the object, but it also uh, gives you a very accurate representation of the illumination function. And here, you only do the tychography to get an accurate illum illumination function and from that, you can calculate, actually, what do you need to correct. 
And by, by laser ablation, you can make a special specular, a special correction plate, a face plate that you put after your, your, your focusing device, and you get a much cleaner focus. So in the end, this is the technology we need, I guess, guess for fourth generation sources. Because if you really want to exploit small focus, we will never be able to get a perfect, uh, perfect optical systems, but we might be able to do corrections. The idea is old. I mean, uh, the seven nanometer focus that done very long and at that one kilometer beam at spring eight has only been able because they had a, a correction mirror to correct uh, the phase errors of the final focusing mirror. And they get more, three times more intensity into the central speckle than uh, without the correction. And that's also something which is interesting for experiments. Uh, the last one I would like to make very briefly is only, uh, uh, the point is if you want to do split and delay in VOV on very short time scale, this is not easy because you have to ad adjust extremely accurate uh, 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 your delay uh, instruments and what people from uh, some nano fabrication people and Tim Lahman from, from Flash came up with is a, a scheme like this where you can move the individual parts very precisely to watch each other. And you really split the, the wave front. And in this way, you can make almost attosecond uh, delays, especially if you, have, you, if you get out a single spike, you really can do extremely an extremely um, accurate and precise uh, control over the delay of a VOV pump probe experiment. And you even can change, I mean, these are the phases, which is more or less just the, what is shown here is, is just the uh, reflection image of this, of this arrangement. You can achieve, uh, uh, extremely uh, uh, precise the adjusted individual wave fronts of the two uh, pulses. And we look forward for first real experiments because that was just a, a, a feasibility study where we could really can do then at a second interferometry, even with a SASE machine. I thought I showed you that because that's political now. All European sources have joined up to a league of European accelerator based photon source. That's important because otherwise we have all the laser guys with us. Uh, we launched that in 2007. Helmut Dosch, uh, Andrew Harrison, and, and uh, Christoph Quitman are heading that, uh, co chairing and chairing that. It's 15 institutions, and the aim is among all the political lobbying and things that to coordinate and collaborate on technical developments in accelerator technology, X ray optics beamline instrumentation, X-ray detectors, data handling, computing, visualization, many more of things. And that's very good because very often we have your own project. Sometimes we have bilateral projects, but we waste resources. And we hope that, first of all, we get considerable funding from the from European Union, from Brussels, we call it always. Like you call it the hill, we, go, we call it Brussels. And uh, we, get, we try to get funding from there, but also to coordinate our efforts. And I think uh, we are quite, quite open also to discuss with other colleagues, and there are already collaborations ongoing, so it's not uh, this way that there's nothing. Brings me to my last slide, or last slides. I mean, this is our site, and you see it's, it's, it's busy. Uh, I talked about the sources already, so I would like to just uh, uh, highlight a few exper uh, uh, institutes that have been established on our site. Maybe most famous is CFEL, where Max Planck, Daisy, and us, uh, the University of Hamburg, and us, Daisy, has established a new institute because it was clear from the beginning the FELs will need new experimental methods, and these new methods need also people to develop them. And that was the main driving force of the CFEL. CFEL is that um, uh, successful that Max Planck decided to build or establish her own Max Planck Institute on that structure and dynamics, on that under the roof of CFEL, which is, uh, in, in Germany at least, was something which is very, very visible. We established together with about um, nine other institutions in the field of structural biology, infection structural biology, the so-called Center for Structural Systems Biology, and the building is just being, uh, being taken over by the users and become operational. What we plan, and uh, groundbreaking will be uh, in October, official was longer, but the, the machinery comes in October, is a new photon science building, which will house a nano lab. I think you have something more elaborated here, but we also noticed that many users need complementary analysis technique or preparation technique to do experiments at the nano scale, and that will be housed here. Uh, we easily, uh, closely collaborate with a university institute as a center for hybrid nanoscience that is already finished and has been established here. The picture is a bit older already, and there is another institution that has been now set up 
which is Harbor. I never can uh, recognize what the acronym stands for, but these people go mostly for time-resolved uh, biochemistry that is done here. Um, we closely collaborate, of course, with EMBL, Elmer's Syndrome, Gestac, I, I mentioned that already. How, you see the site is full, we hardly have any additional space, and that's maybe not very official, but uh, that's what we plan in the future. The university decided that the entire physics faculty comes out to us, which is good, because then we get also access to a lot of students, and this is, gives the whole and totally different spirit to such a research site. Also, the chemistry faculty considers coming out on our site, However, since we run out of space, and maybe those of you that have been in the days already know that there's a horse race here, but that's given up. And we have approached the, uh, the, the city of Hamburg where the university and us could have part of that space, at least for office building, guest houses, a conference center, and things like that. So that's more or less, it's not yet settled, but the, university, uh, the city of Hamburg is very positive about that. And we also have an innovation center here, and down there there's a, a big a new uh, innovation campus where we also could uh, think that uh, we could get additional uh, synergy effects. Structural biology in Hamburg, if it will be enlarged, it's already decided that it will be close to the CSSB here. Of course, they have very short ways to the structural biology beam like Sierra Petra, which is, of course, a big benefit for them. So that brings me to, my, to the summary. Uh, I, make, I make it short. The next generation of synchrotron sources, I think they have a big potential. They will boost the science and additionally. It will take some time until it really comes to the applications, uh, but I think there is a huge potential, uh, especially for in situ and operando studies. This is, these are those areas where other techniques can do something but are not as good as X-rays just due to the penetrating properties that we have. Uh, we call it always the ultimate 3D microscope, and we can apply a variety of contrasts. I mean, it can be scattering, it can be diffraction, it can be any absorption, fluorescence, God name it. So we, are, we have a big portfolio here that we can exploit. And, but I think also in the field of, uh, uh, field of data science, I mentioned already, but also in instrumentation, we might need to, to work very hard in really to exploit these unique possibilities that the new sources will give us. Uh, FELs, they open, they are opening new analytical window, except I think, maybe I should make a statement here and you don't cite me on that, but most of the experiments are either exploiting the high brilliance or the short time. Almost very few experiments really exploit the large lateral coherence. And I think a diffraction-limited storage ring in, in the lateral coherence due to the stability this source will have might be at least uh, superior in, in, in coherence experiments, uh, let's say in imaging experiments, as an FEL, if we, don't, we are not able to seed them and make them more stable in, in, in the reproducibility of the bunches. We have, of course, we can do uh, experiments atomic length and femtosecond timescales, ultra short timescales we can achieve. We can look on matter far away from equilibrium, excited states in reactions. We can look on nonlinear effects, but we also can look on ultra high brightness effects and this diffract before destruction experiments that are done in serial femtosecond crystallography, for example. I think uh, we at DAISY with our partners, which is European XFEL, Max Planck, the universities, are quite well prepared to, to make a visible, a very visible contribution to this field. We have Petra 3, which is already quite good source, not as large in number of uh, individual beam lines, but from what the beam quality we can provide. And we, of course, try to we'll make all the effort to, to keep it up to date by uh, appropriate updates. Uh, Flash is one of the first FELs in, 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 as a user machine. And we, for, for these fields, we certainly will further develop the machine. And the European XFL, at least, well, we always can decide in which field powerful, but it, is, it will for, for some time be the most powerful hard X-ray laser. I know that Chinese, China wants to build something bigger already, so don't know how long this holds. And, uh, but here we have certainly very good opportunities, and uh, we have uh, dedicated support laboratories also in order to facilitate the research at these facilities. This is actually what I wanted to give as a short overview. I would like to thank you for your uh, attention, and uh, I'm happy to take questions. And if you are, have a bit of time, I can show you some nice uh, videos from Excel later on. So I have to start off with one question, which is if early users are friendly users, what are late users? Does that mean that they're hostile users? Did I say late users? Um, uh, 
Late users are those that probably want to do an experiment when the machine has been shut down. Yeah. I, I don't know, but. So questions for, uh, Har uh, for uh, Edgar, I'm sorry. So starting off with one on uh, the developments for Petra 4. So uh, you pointed out the difference between the, uh, the high spectral brightness and the time resolved research that's going on. Can you say a few words about what time structure you expect to have for Petra okay. 4? Okay. At the moment, we have uh, 40 bunches with 192 nanoseconds. This is the MUS power, typical MUS, uh, iron MUS power operation mode. Many of the time resolved experiments are also in that because then you can gate comfortably. We operate in 80 bunch mode and then more or less uh, high bunch fillings, 480, okay. which is uh, 16 femto, uh, nanoseconds, and of 960 bunch mode, which is 8 nanoseconds. We hope that we can at Petra 4 at least maintain an 80 bunch mode, maybe okay. at a reduced current, even a 40 bunch mode. Very likely, this will meet, and this is now for the expert uh, need, this is for the experts among you. We will need an another RF system which makes longer bunches, otherwise the lifetime is just too bad and we okay. continuously inject. Okay. But we are really in the middle of that process to optimize the parameters. Okay, it sounds like a very uh, uh, familiar problem. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, how does that, so uh, what is your sense of uh, where the MOS power users will go in that case? And you, think we want to keep the most power users. They, it's, it's a small community, but they do very good science. In Urchin, I'm looking out for you. So. Urchin. <laughs> and uh, the point is, uh, they told us when they, we go from something like uh, 100 or 90 femtosecond full with half maximum bunch lengths to something we like 400, that will not jeopardize their experiments. Yep. They need the gap and they need the clean bunches. This is the main, main issues. And we hope at least that we can get 80. Okay. But we not re maybe at a reduced current 40. Okay. Uh, or we have to blow up the coupling okay. because at the moment we really want to have something vertically five picometers and horizontally something in the 20, 20 regime. Uh, we could go up to 20 upwards and then make good okay. for something that we, we okay. lose if we, we squeeze the bunch. Okay. Other questions? Uda. Let's put it this way, we have not decided on that finally, but at the moment we had to make the decision when we built Petra 3 either to count undulators, undulator straights, or to have bending magnets, but we cannot have both. And it's very tight because uh, the angle between, at Petra, the angle between two undulators is the same like between an undulator and a bending magnet at, at let's say, the ESRF. I think here it's a bit smaller because your machine is larger than the ESRF considerably. Mm -hmm. Uh, if we cannot cant anymore in future, because the canting is really on, 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 on the edge, canting reduces, uh, increases the emittance. So we might uh, remove all the canting. Then we need to, uh, to, in order just to get the number of beam lines, and we have some techniques that do not necessarily need an undulator, we will probably think about using bending magnets. How that's been done, it's far away from, from, from that's, Maybe we know that by next year, that time, maybe not even there. We think about it. But if we can keep canning, we probably prefer to have short undulators because they still provide more intensity than a bending magnet. And we have, we have X of speedman on undulators. And you see them moving all the time. Uh, but uh, uh, that's, that's at least the philosophy for the moment. I think about if we can't cant, we probably need them in order just to get the uh, reasonable number of beam lines. Booker. Uh, you have shown some great success in nanofocusing using MLS. Yeah. Um, is there any focus effort within like uh, European sources? And, and if yes, if they're targeted efforts, what are the goals for nanofocusing in zone phase and MLS? The point is, we are just working on that. So I'm, I'm responsible, no, I should say Jean Dayon, the head of Soleil, and myself, I'm uh, uh, responsible for the instrumentation package in LIPS, and we have set up uh, an optics subwork package, and they work on that. In the end, it's a sort of uh, uh, um, the PSI guys take the zone plate. We have some multi layers. ESRF is is going for the multi uh, for the KB uh, multi layer mirror systems. Uh, the, these people work out a roadmap, and we try to get additional funding. <coughs> 
I think, of course, as far as I've understood these guys, I have not seen their final documents so far, the aim is to go below the 10 nanometers as it's now and make them reproducible. The question is also, one should be honest, this is, has been shown, it can be done possible, but the working distance of these devices is extremely small. So the question is really, can I use this beam? Uh, because many of the experiments need at least a minimum working distance. If you just use it as a virtual source for, let's say, another focusing device, then it's fine. Or, or for, for a, a projection, um, a phase contrast imaging, or whatever else you can do with such a, so, uh, a source. Uh, if you want to do a diffraction experiment with this beam, it becomes extremely uh, difficult because I think the, the, the focal width was below a few millimeters. So one has really to see what can we do with such a beam and what can be done. And this, with, of course, if you have a deflection limited source, in the end you get the same smaller focus with what you get in source size down, you get in, in addition uh, in, in, in focal uh, spot length for the same source size. But you know, this is not an order of magnitude. And whether you have three millimeters or 30 millimeters, yeah, okay, we can do more with 30 millimeters with three, but it's not, you can do not, not have a big magnet there or something like that. So uh, the ga aim is to go in that uh, direction. Uh, our main game is also, I mean, at the moment, and you have the same problem that we have, we rely on one company in Osaka to get good mirrors. And we would like to have at least a second source for that in Europe, maybe even a third source. And we try to get two film, uh, companies involved because this is also what Brussels requests, that we have the technology more than once in a world because we really rely on this one company and that's actually for the future when we have all these upgraded machines and everyone needs new mirrors. It's not that they have a monopole, which is also a problem, but it's also a capacity problem. I mean, you wait for ages if you want to have a new mirror, even if you put the, num the, the money on the table. You have probably similar experience than we have. So I apologize, we promised that we would give Edgar some tours of the APS, and one of the tours actually has to start just about 4.15. Uh, so I'm gonna have to uh, add, beg people's patience. Uh, let's thank Edgar again for a fascinating coverage of uh, what's happening at Daisy. Very nice, really fabulous.